Good evening, and welcome to the Zoo Fall 2023 Continuing Education Series. Uh, my name is Dr. Howard Rappaport. I'm the uh, director of our dental residency program. I want to welcome you to the course. Um, there are a few housekeeping items uh, before we get started. Uh, the first thing is please uh, stay on mute during the presentation. Um, we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, the questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation. So please enter them in the Q&A box. Uh, to receive the CDE credit, uh, please remember to complete the evaluation at the end of the presentation. Uh, the link to complete the evaluation will be posted on our continuing education page at zoofallhealthoneword.org slash CDE, zoofallhealth.org slash CDE. Uh, the evaluation will remain open for a week. Uh, once the survey is closed, uh, certificates will be issued to the participants. Um, you'll also find links at the same site, zoofallhealth.org slash CDE for any upcoming courses. Uh, you can register for those future courses and there's some exciting stuff coming up. Um, also, uh, there is a slide coming up, I believe, that will display our past courses. Um, after the course ends, you'll find a survey uh, below Dr. Geimer's name on our CDE webpage. Again, this evaluation will be open for one week. Your certificate will be sent to you in the following two to three weeks. Um, so at this moment, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Shade Cronin. She's the um, as an SVP of External Affairs. Uh, we will share a couple of announcements before announcing, introducing our guest speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rappaport, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Shade Cronin, as Dr. Rappaport said. I'm the Senior VP of External Affairs here at Zufall. I just want to share a little bit about Zufall in case some of you are new um, to Zufall and don't know who we are. Zufall Health is a federally qualified health center. We are located in Northwest and Central New Jersey. Uh, we were founded in 1990 by Dr. Robert Zufall and his wife, Catherine, as you can see from the, the photograph here on the slide, um, as a small free clinic. Uh, currently, Zufall has 12 sites across seven different counties, and we take care of about 45,000 low-income and underserved patients um, each year. I want to thank our generous sponsors, Delta Dental, um, Delta has been a wonderful partner for Zoo Falls for many years. Uh, they are sponsors of our continuing dental education series. They have also been supporters of Zoo Fall through a number of other projects. They support our uh, de Delta Dental Mobile Unit, our Smiles for Our Heroes event, uh, which is an annual event where we provide uh, low or no cost dental services to veterans. Um, and that will be coming up in the spring of 2024. We're really excited to bring that event back after a, a long hiatus due to COVID. Um, and Delta has also supported uh, our new West Orange Building Dental Department, uh, which is our new site in West Orange, uh, which will be opening later this fall um, in early November. We want to also share with you a, a number of um, exciting uh, oral health initiatives that we have at Zufall. As Dr. Rappaport said, please check out our website. You can see some of the upcoming CDE courses. We also have a community dental health coordinator program. Uh, this trains dental and other health professionals to use community-based interventions um, to help patients overcome barriers to their oral health care. We are just um, completing our current class, our inaugural class uh, finished last September. Um, our second class is completing their work now and we will be beginning a third class in uh, early 2024. So tonight we'd like to welcome Dr. Steve Geierman. Uh, Dr. Geierman is a retired captain in the U.S. Public Health Service who recently retired from the American Dental Association where he served as the senior manager for access, community oral health infrastructure and capacity. He serves on the boards of the American Institute for Dental Public Health, the Organization for Safety, Asepsis and Prevention, the Dental Lifeline Network, the Dental Patient Safety Foundation, and the National Oral Health Connection Team of the Oral Health Progress and Equity Network. 
Dr. Geierman, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We are grateful to have you here and I will now turn it over to you. All right, thank you. And since I don't have a little kid here, we'll see if I can share my screen. And that's a yes. Very fine. Can you hear me okay? I'm assuming yes. Yes, we right. can hear you, Dr. Geerman. All right, but thank you. So thank you all for joining me tonight. And let's make sure that my slides will move. That's an important piece. Hmm. All right, we're gonna unshare for a moment and start again. Very good. So our physician colleagues, when they graduate and move into uh, practice, they do take a Hippocratic Oath, which says, we will first do no harm. Dentists don't do that, but it is understood that we also do no harm. Those of you who are old enough to remember the Marathon Man will know what this slide is from. If any of you have ever been asked by a colleague or a friend, a family member, can you refer me to a good dentist? What does good mean? Good means in, in the patient's mind, they do not hurt me, they're friendly, but nobody except us really knows what quality is about. Safety falls into that same situation. There are assumptions made by patients and by the dental staff that dental care is safe, and by and large, it is. But there are some other assumptions we should think about. One is an unsafe environment is not widely publicized. Mm, we're pretty quiet about when, when bad things happen. And then those last two, dentistry through self-regulation or external leg legislation is open to recreating itself. Maybe, but when you think about the first one, when bad things happen, we don't really talk about it. That third one sort of gets a little iffy. And then the fourth one, dentistry responds positively when it sees opportunities for improvement, maybe. Now is the time to actually think about safety. And I will say, uh, I don't normally read my slides and I won't hear either, but if there's words on the slide, I'll be talking around them. You should read them and we'll move forward together. So this is how most of us get news about bad things happening in a dental chair. We read about it on Facebook or in the newspaper, and this is true for patients as well as dentists. And this is a true statement. In this age of ignorance, in this age of information, ignorance is a choice. We don't wanna be this guy. And we believe this, this will never happen to me. So I wanna start out tonight by talking briefly about COVID because we've all just lived through it and there are new variants floating around, but we're learning to live with this. So what did it do for us in terms of safety? And we're not talking about this. We started out that way. We progressed to a point where learning to practice dentistry with COVID, it's about safety. And it's not just safety for the patient, it's safety for the provider and for our staff. And Clemenson was uh, the ADA president when COVID was just starting to take hold. And he said, and I will read this, COVID has actually given us a head start on safety. We've been forced to look at everything we do and we have made changes rapidly. Despite the contention that remains, we are already safe. And we learned some things from the pandemic. 
bad things can happen to good people. We need dedicated healthcare providers in this time. And I'm very thankful to all the physicians, nurses, and all of our medical colleagues who stood in there and kept going, even when they almost were exhausted on their feet. Dentistry will be forever changed, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But common sense and the scientific method will prevail. How many of you heard during COVID people whining, when will we ever get back to normal? I heard that a lot, and there are two answers to that. The first one, when I heard that, would be never. When, when I was a young dentist, we did not, I did not wear gloves, eye protection. Uh, I was an Indian Health Service dentist. I wore jeans and a flannel shirt. And that was normal for us. But when HIV came around and we learned about bloodborne pathogens, we would never now think about touching a patient without gloves, eye protection. And we have universal precautions. We assume everyone is positive and we proceed accordingly. With COVID and a respiratory or air borne virus, universal precautions will expand so that it's part of our life now but people still need dental care and we will learn to adjust. There was a second answer though to that question. When will we ever get back to normal? And my answer was, why would you want to? And I say that because before COVID, less than half the people in this country could access dental care. And I don't wanna go back to the status quo and especially knowing the good work that Zoo Fall does for the underserved, we need to expand and take an interdisciplinary approach to care. And luckily, our medical colleagues have been walking down the safety road for more than 30 years intensely, and we can learn from that. So what is safety? Safety is the reduction of preventable harm to patient staff and ourselves. And formalizing safety, it's not a new thing. And I just pulled these from old uh, ADA news, all kinds of different things. Addressing safety. But we often still take safety for granted. This is a slide from before COVID when the third leading cause of death in this country was from medical error. I think it still is, COVID I think is fourth. But I would ask you to think right now, how many people do you think died in a dental chair from let's say 1956 to 2017? Think about a number in your head. 218 on 1955. And that was based on 20 studies found in a literature review. That seems quite low for me. Of course, one is too many, and we always aim for zero harm. But because dentists were hesitant to talk about when things go wrong, or people may have got up from the chair and got home and something bad happened, it's not always related back uh, to the dentistry area. But things can change. So this is a slide that Dr. Dr. Rappaport will find interesting. And someone of my age, I've been a dentist 40 years now. For a young person coming into dentistry, might be kind of surprised. There was a time, as I mentioned earlier, when gloves were optional. We did not have universal precautions. Needles were reused. I know a dentist, he had stainless steel needles and he put them in a Bunsen burner to sterilize them. Kind of creepy. We thought opioids were harmless. 
I already mentioned my standard uh, gear on the Indian Health Service was jeans and a flannel shirt. And now we have a much different thought about that. We disinfected with rubbing alcohol. X-rays and film holders. There was a time when we would ask the dental assistant to stand in with the patient who was covered with a lead apron and ask them to hold the film in place while we snap them. We don't do that anymore either, thank goodness. I hated my dentist when I was a kid because he smoked two packs of Marlboros a day in the office. Nitrous machines were just coming into vogue and blue is a very pretty color, but not on for Caucasian patients. Uh, you want a good mix of, of oxygen so that you can, you know, keep people uh, breathing. And immunizations were just starting. I was one of the first people, uh, I was part of a pilot study with hepatitis B. We're lucky because we've come a long way and we have improved in terms of safety and what our standard protocols are. But a lot of bad things can happen. And I wanna tell you one story as you just kind of look through all of these areas where things can go wrong. There's a pediatric dentist who's probably on this call right now, but he was walking through an operatory and he tripped over a cord. And he looked at the dental assistant and said, you know, that's dangerous. And her response was something to the effect of, you're right, you're the fourth person this week to trip over that cord. We need to realize when we see something, we need to fix it and move things forward. And we also have to move beyond that thought of, oh, bad things are never gonna happen to me. And I will just mention nitrous. I will often tell the story about, we don't want patients to catch fire in our chair. And they look at me like that never happens. And it's like, do you, and I will ask the dentist, do you use nitrous? I do. Do you use nitrous with your anxious adult patients? Why I do. And I said, and you do know to have a good mix of oxygen with that nitrous? And it's like, of course I do. So the patient is relaxed and it's a very oxygen rich environment in their mouth, which is flammable. And I asked the dentist, do you ever smooth off a crown with a high speed? Well, I do. And as the blood drained out of the dentist's face, and this happened to be an ADA trustee, I said, all it would take is for you to throw one spark and the patient goes up in flames. And as the blood drained out of his face, he said, I just did that yesterday. And I said, you won't be doing that again, will you? So we want to learn as we move forward. Rare is the provider who has never experienced any of these. I've experienced all of these except the last one. And the good thing is, unless we fail, we actually don't learn. And we become a better practitioner because of it. But it would be nice if I could learn from the experience of others so that I don't have to experience that same bad thing myself, along with my patient. Good doctors do make mistakes. And we need systems in place to safeguard, again, our patients, our staff, and ourselves. Challenges, our passion about safety often depends upon our experience. And I already said, you know, we assume safety. And dentists are sheltered, though the number of private practitioners are going down with uh, DSOs and uh, other options for practice. But dentistry has very little requirements for reporting. There is not a data clearinghouse per se. And we'll talk about transparency as we move forward. 
And again, there is an opportunity to learn from the experience of others, but we haven't taken advantage of that. And the unfortunate thing is we don't know what we don't know until it's too late. So this is a, a book when we talk about safety, James Reason, all six of these are really important. And I just want to say, it's, again, we learn from our failures. It's human error is what it means to be human. They're not intrinsically bad unless you don't learn from it. We shouldn't have to trip over a cord five times before we pick that cord up. So error management helps us manage the system. And if we fail to govern ourselves, others will step in and do it for us. That's the definition of a profession. We police ourselves. I don't know how many of you read the morning huddle today, which is, it's a small flyer that you can get uh, from the ADA free and it collects all the oral health information that's in uh, printed or on the news, uh, television and so forth. And this was one of the lead articles today. Presidential advisors recommend White House create patient safety team. So when you think about, we profess that dentistry, oral health is integral to overall health. Our medical colleagues already have been working on patient safety for 30 years since Lucian Leap wrote his book, To Air is Human. And they have made really good progress, but they work on it every day. Dentistry, we, we're not there yet. And I'll talk more about that. And when I'm done, uh, I will be sharing these slides and all of these hyperlinks will be live so you can go and find them. So what's a culture of safety? It's basically how we do things. And I like that last bullet. It's the way we do things when nobody's looking. So watch the picture. Oops, drop something. Five second rule, put it back. That may work in the kitchen. It shouldn't work in the dental office. So when you think about a culture of safety, other people are thinking about this. Paul Casamassimo is a pediatric dentist and a professor emeritus at the, the Ohio State University. I'm a Michigan boy, went to dental school there. I have matured enough that I can say Ohio State, but Paul often writes about safety. Another place where you can learn more is, I don't know if you have visited the Journal of the California Dental Association. If you haven't, you should Google that. And it's the journal issues are free. They're on a multitude of topics. But this one about safety and dentistry, there were two, and I wanna say it was in 2018 or 2019, there was a July and a September issue, about 10, 12 articles that are just very clear about how to start attacking unsafe practices within your dental practice. But unfortunately, you notice these uh, bubbles, which normally have words in them, when you go to a local dental society meeting and what happens there, people network, they fellowship, they have a cocktail, they do continuing dental education. When bad things happen, they may lean over and whisper it to their colleagues, but they don't bring it out in public. People are quiet. We need to find ways, safe systems that can employ barriers to harm. And some of these are physical. You'll often hear people talk about a Swiss cheese model. If, if you take Swiss cheese and separate those slices, mix them up, 
the holes no longer are aligned. And if you have six pieces of cheese and those are the barriers, the harm event will get stopped before it gets all the way through. But safe sy systems are not always physical. They're also how we work and how we share. It's not about blaming, but it's about finding ways to actually protect the safety of patients, our staff, and ourselves in a manner that we learn from our mistakes and we move forward. So I'm wondering how many of you have ever heard of the Dental Patient Safety Foundation? It's a PSO. A PSO is a patient safety organization. And there are, are about 200 of them in the country. The vast majority address our medical colleagues. Hospitals, uh, for instance, have to report errors, near misses, when bad things happen to a patient safety organization. They look at them, they analyze, they share the analysis so that everyone can learn and move it forward. I live in Chicago and I found out there is one PSO, patient safety organization, totally dedicated to dental. And it's in my backyard out by O'Hare, the airport. And in an anonymous and non-discoverable manner, healthcare providers, dentists, dental hygienists, therapists, can report near misses and adverse incidents in an anonymous and non-discoverable manner. This is an organization that is fully vetted by the federal government. And as we gather information, we write reports and, and we share them freely. I serve on the board of this foundation. Uh, and you'll see the hyperlink at the bottom where you can go and you can read these reports. You can also sign up, it's free. And as a new report comes out, it'll be sent to you. I retired from the American Dental Association a little over a year ago. And while I was there, I convinced the ADA House of Delegates, so the supreme governing body of dentistry, that this was an important foundation. And a, a resolution was passed by the House in 2021 that encouraged all dentists to report in an, again, anonymous, non-discoverable manner near misses and adverse incidents so that we all could learn from them without having to experience it ourselves. In miracle of miracles, an entire year passed and there was not a single report. Obviously, we are safe. Obviously, that's a lie. We are safe, but bad things happen. But people are quiet about it. And part of the problem is transparency. Most dentists think if I talk when, about a bad thing when it happens, I'm going to get sued. It increases lawsuits. Well, that's not true. And I'll give you an example from the University of Michigan, again, where I did my training both undergrad and in grad school. The University of Michigan health system is big. Besides the general hospital, there's a woman's hospital, children's cancer, uh, take your pick. But the health system made a choice over a decade ago that they would be absolutely transparent when bad things happen. They would share it and they would learn from it. And after analyzing that stance, the cost of liability was reduced by almost 60% by this medical error disclosure program. It did not necessarily lead to a bad reputation. It's the right thing to do. Why don't we do this? And these are some of the reasons. We're afraid. We don't know whose responsibility it is. Hopefully someone else will take control and we don't wanna be blamed. 
So the House of Delegates, they actually created a work group, a culture of safety and dentistry work group. I was the staffer that walked with them for five years. And we did a lot of good work. And we found this group, the Collaborative for Accountability and Improvement. It's out of the University of Washington. It's actually a group of lawyers primarily. And you think, oh my God, why do I want to talk to them? For over 20 years, they have worked with physicians, nurses, and pharmacists to embrace transparency, especially through conflict resolution. The conflict resolution is with ourselves. And they have actually taught people how to be more comfortable. And they were eager to work with the dental profession. And we are still working with them at this moment. Transparency is a precondition for a culture of safety in dentistry. It's a practiced value. It doesn't just happen like that. But it's really important if we're going to have a reliable, safe culture. And it's it's all about learning and improvement. But transparency is difficult. We live in a culture that we're secret. It's technically difficult. Again, whose responsibility is this? And we are human, so we know errors do happen. And if you click on that hyperlink when you get this slide deck, that's an hour long of presentation that Dr. Tom Gallagher, who's the executive director of the of this collaborative at the University of Washington, he's an internist by training. But he actually gave a talk that we recorded before the council that I served, uh, the Council on Advocacy for Access and Prevention at the ADA. And we actually gave uh, scenarios. And I, I can share one of them. There was and we said it was in an FQHC, a patient came in to have number 30 and 31, uh, those lower molars to be extracted uh, in preparation for a partial denture. The dentist who had treatment planned was out sick, but the patient was still brought in and another dentist was going to do the extractions. And, you know, he looked the patient over, numbed him up, came back and extracted 29, 30, and 31. So they took out the second bicuspid as well. When I was a young dentist, my thought would have been, all right, we're going to add another tooth to that partial denture. Except for the fact number 29 was the abutment tooth that the partial denture was being built on. The dentist who did the extractions didn't even realize what he had done. It was only a day or two later when the patient called back and said, this space just seems really big. And the dentist went back and realized he had taken out an extra tooth. And when you watch this video, it's live. There are actors who portray the patient and her husband. And one of the volunteers from my council, cold, was the dentist who did the extractions, at least in our role play. And that's all I'm gonna share right now, but let's just say it was a very interesting discussion. And I think uh, you will learn more from that. So we did a survey. We asked 100 dentists, when things go wrong in your practice, and things do, do you feel that you have the experience and the necessary resources to be able to talk to the patient and your peers when bad things happen in dentistry? Over 90% said, we do not, we are not comfortable. I brought this to the trustees for action and they said, kind of a small survey, do it with 10,000 dentists. So we did. The results mirrored the small pilot. Again, over 90% of dentists do not feel comfortable when bad things happen in practice to talk with either the patient 
or their peers. The Collaborative for Accountability and Improvement actually had helped again, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy embrace transparency. And we have five continuing education modules ready to go. And we just needed funding for that. And I'm just being very transparent here. When I brought this to the trustees, they thought about it and said, no, we're safe enough. Which is very disheartening to me, especially when over 90% of dentists say we are not comfortable or stressed. So I'm also an ADA member. And I don't take no for an answer. So I am currently on my own working with other dental organizations to actually bring this forward. And if we can get this work done, these five modules, they will be on a site. They will be free, not just to dentists, but to anyone, your, all of your team members so that they can learn. They'll not just be PowerPoints with narrative, but they'll they'll actually have filmed case studies. And as you work through them and you choose answers, you'll go down different paths so that you can learn from the experience. So we're still in the midst of this, but the important thing is more than 90% of dentists do not feel comfortable when bad things happen in practice to be able to talk about it. And again, if we don't police ourselves, someone else will do it for us. I was a Fed for 24 years. The ADA is not a fan of Uncle Sam stepping in and saying, you will do this. But I will tell you, if we don't get our act together, someone else will put the act together for us. So I would encourage you as grassroots members of the dental community, if you believe patient, dental staff and provider safety is important, speak about it to your trustees, to your local dental society, to the New Jersey Dental Association and get the ball rolling again, but I'll keep things moving as best I can. So if we're going to enhance a culture of safety, there are four things you can do today. One is lead with humility and ask questions. Encourage your staff to speak up. If they see something, they should say something. We need to report harm events and near misses. The Dental Patient Safety Foundation, we actually chase people down in an anonymous and non-discoverable manner, but we try to find out what has happened so that we can share it with others. And we need to practice our communication skills. Again, it's about conflict resolution and the conflict is, is with ourselves. So I would ask you, you notice I have learned in my old age how to use PowerPoint. But what, what would you prefer? Do you want someone to throw you that life preserver on the right after you're already drowning? Or should we be proactive and actually start trying to find ways to learn from one another so that we can grow in this? I do want to share, uh, in my retirement, I'm busy, but I'm busy of my own choosing. And I'm currently the board chair for OSAP, which is the Organization for Safety, Asepsis, and Prevention. We're the National Dental Infection Control Group. We work with the CDC a lot. And recently we had five listening sessions with the CDC and we invited dentists to come in because there is a 2003 dental infection control guidance that did get updated a bit to address COVID, but it needed an overhaul and we're doing that now. So we brought in listening sessions 
to get people's perspectives. What could we do better? I'm sorry to say that the vast number of dentists, especially private practice dentists who came, when we talked about the 2003 Dental Infection Control Guidance, it's like, that's an interesting document. I've never seen it. And it's like, I'm sorry, you're practicing. And they would say, well, someone else takes care of that in my practice. The hygienist, one of the dental assistants. And you know, that's fine. The fact that your staff has stepped forward to take responsibility in helping organize and lead you all to safety. But when a bad thing happens, the buck doesn't stop with them. It stops with the dentist. Nine out of 10 dentists who are who participated in the listening session did not know what that 2003 infection control guidance was about. We are doing our best at OSAP to actually encourage people to come and find out. Those of you who are students, if you go to osap.org, osap.org, there is free membership for any student, dentist, hygienist, dental assistant, dental therapist, community dental health coordinator, and resident. And if you are a, a graduated dentist, if you're part of an organization like an FQHC, a DSO, you probably have an organizational membership. If you're part of a private practice, membership is not uh, a huge amount of money. It's currently $150 a year. But the kind of information can save you and your practice a lot of heartache, heartache and grief. You know, you remember when I said there, there are a lot of bad things that can happen and I've experienced all of them except the waterline issue. That's been a growing concern across the country. There have been problems in California, in Georgia, where people have really been adversely affected because of improper cleansing of our water lines. So I would encourage you, think about OSAP.org and think about encouraging a culture of safety to move forward. Go and look up the Dental Patient Safety Foundation. If you Google it, it will pop up. It's free. And I would end by saying, if not us, then who? And I appreciate your time. Uh, that's me pulling my hair out from when I worked at the ADA. Things are calmer now. But uh, Tooth Guy 773, I am not the 773rd. That happens to be my area code. But that email does work. And I would be more than happy to answer questions for you. And if you have a few now, Dr. Rappaport, I am willing. So thank you. And I'm giving it back to you. Okay, I'm I'm good. I got Elizabeth. All right. Thank what you. I do with that, Elizabeth. Um, in the event of a harmful event, uh, uh, event in a, the dental office during treatment, um, how would you advise communicating, talking to the patients about that? Well, it also depends on the circumstance, but I would not hide it. But you know, we are professionals. So we never want to say, oops, we, we actually want <laughs> to maintain our composure. And that's, that goes for the assistance as well. But if we see something, if we have to stop, we stop. But think about being proactive. Those two life preservers, think about the kind of things we do in oral surgery, where we actually stop, we actually mark the tooth we might be addressing, we make sure that we're anesthetizing on the right side uh, versus the left, depending on what the situation is. But that's, that's part of what the training that we are proposing. It actually 
helps you address the issue with uh, patients. Uh, I will tell you that the other scenario that uh, we brought to educate our council, it was a mom with a pediatric, one of her kids went to a general dentist and the general dentist said, no cavities, everything looks great. And the kid had a toothache. The den general dentist was on vacation. The mom uh, was referred to a pediatric dentist in the town. And when the kid opened his mouth, it was early childhood caries, baby ball tooth decay from front to back. Hmm. So the pediatric dentist did talk to the mom about this and address the kid's need. But she said, my dentist just said there were there was no cavities. As the specialist, what do you do? How do you say that to the mom? Do I call up the general dentist and say, hey, bud, what is up with you? But at the same time, dentistry is the business. And specialists rely on general dentists for referrals. I hate to say that, but it's real life. So huh, I'm not I'm not answering your question perfectly clear, Howard, because it does it does depend on this on the situation. You also don't just blurt out what happened. You have to think about it and how you share it so you don't cause anxiety in the patient but you want to be clear. And honest. And honest, yes. And how are you going to ameliorate that problem? Yes, and yeah. we're going to fix it. We're going to make make you right and, and be able to, as the University of Michigan showed, errors still occurred but they were very upfront about it. And people did not run off to sue. They knew who we were, we're human beings. People are more likely to sue when they think you're trying to hide something. I think we're afraid of losing their trust because something has happened. And I think that you can only enhance your trust by telling something that did happen inadvertently. It exactly. doesn't necessarily mean that, you, that you're a bad dentist, but things, something had happened and we're going to take care of it. Exactly. And that's, and we all have things in our lives where we learn from the experience and, you know, it's hopefully it's rare that it happens again. Okay. Um, well, this came out of chat, not the Q and A. Are there good resources for the risk managers in our organization that don't have much experience dealing with patients and providers after an a iatrogenic event? There are. So when you get this slide deck, they, I would go to uh, some of the ones that I referred. There are some good presentations. Uh, on the ADA website, they're in front of the firewall. They're on ADA CE online. Anyone can access it. You do not have to be a dentist. You do not have to be a member. You just create an account, which is free, and you can access it. Whether you're an FQHC dentist or private practice, a DSO, we all have liability insurance. Liability insurance companies have a vested interest in safety as well. And in fact, if you take a safety course, you can often get a premium discount, five to 10%, which can be pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. They also offer courses. Uh, it was right before COVID, the Academy of General Dentistry, they were having a big meeting in San Francisco, in uh, Las Vegas. And they asked us to do a, a three hour presentation of this material. And we were ready, but COVID came. So they opted, they had over 150 courses. They chose four that they thought were most pertinent that they did by Zoom. We were one of the four. 
we had 800 people participate. That was in August. And we repeated it in November to 1,100 additional. And that was free. And it did amount to a great amount of information. There were resources listed, but liability insurers actually can uh, provide information as well. It, there's not a lot of it at the in organized dentistry because we're quiet and private about it. Uh, going back to the Organization for Safety, as sepsis and prevention, uh -huh. the OSAP, um, mm -hmm. could you be a little bit more specific as to what uh, you would actually be aimed at in terms of the safety for the dental students, hygienists, uh, uh, assistants, and so forth? Well, think about it in terms of, let me answer the question in another way. Dental schools, and we'll just pick on them because you and I happen to be dentists. Dental schools, by and large, do an excellent job protecting the safety of their students, their patients, and the institution. My question to them is always, and I serve on the, the Dean's Advisory Board at the University of Michigan, and I ask the question, hey, once you graduate, what have you taught the dentist, if they have to set up a dental infection control program from scratch, which in private practice, you may have to, unless you happen to steal an experienced dental assistant from someone else who actually has skill in that area. But that's an important piece. I laud the dental schools where students have to spend a week or more in central sterilization to see how sterilization is done because otherwise they open their door and they look for the two windows. Dirty stuff goes in this window, clean stuff appears magically in the other window. It doesn't happen that way. So OSAP actually gives very clear uh, guidance in terms of sterilization in terms of being proactive, in terms of being ready. You know, hospitals and medical offices are often, and FQHCs as well, they're accredited by the Joint Commission or AAAHC. And in the past, those organizations didn't know what to do with dentistry. They would come and visit us and just check if our refrigerator was cold. That's not the case anymore. They are learning to be much more uh, proactive because people like me are working with them. So you can learn how to sterilize your hand pieces. Does the same sterilization protocol that you use for your instruments, does that go for your hand pieces? There are people back in the HIV days, they wanted to wipe high-speed hand pieces off with just disinfectant because yeah. do you know how expensive those are <laughs> and the ada actually was going along with that until the the dentist who eventually became the first head of the division of oral health at the cdc he said well you can do that but there will be uh there's going to be an expose on 60 minutes by a microbiologist from Emory Sunday night, who's going to talk about what happens if you don't sterilize. Amazingly, sterilization happened. So sometimes you have to, I prefer a carrot, but every now and then you have to give people a whack with a stick to do the right thing. Okay. But again, I wanna say though, it's not about blame. It's about learning from your experiences and moving forward. Right. So OSAP, you can learn a lot there. And if you teach students, have them, see I'm bad, I'm the board chair, but have them become members and you can go and look on with them and figure out, it's like, you know, this is worth $150. My practice should actually do this. Yeah. And I would encourage, there are certifications 
that let's just say you have a dental hygienist who oversees infection control and prevention in your office. He or she can take some courses and actually be certified. And your practice will be better off and you would be better off by offering a bonus to them mm -hmm. because they're actually keeping your patients, yourself, and your staff safe. Yeah. What interests you know? me in particular is that yeah. overseeing this dental residency program, these kids just out of dental school, I think this is going to be, and we have regular faculty meetings. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thank you it for would, this. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I have one more question. Uh, please. Uh, can you address the use of patient safety checklists and timeouts before starting a procedure? I fully endorse both of those. Yeah. You know, have you ever noticed when you get on a plane that yeah. <laughs> the, the first officer is outside winter or 115 degrees in Palm Springs with his clipboard or her clipboard, and they're going through the list? Right. We need to do the same. And it just makes sense. And I love timeouts. It's not for kids to stand in the corner, but I can, I remember a time when I numbed up the wrong side to do a restoration. And luckily my dental assistant pointed it out after I was done. Uh, as many of you know, uh, cavities are often mirror images and there there was decay on that side too but Poor that choice. doesn't it doesn't excuse <laughs> the situation and i did i did bring it up yeah we all learn and i would encourage you if you found this to be valuable bring it up share the share the powerpoint with uh members of your local dental society uh dr sid whitman another pediatric dental residency director is was on the call tonight you know howard sid speak about this and let people know so okay. i just want to say thank you very much this was a pleasure and i well thank you so much dr geimer this is an amazing presentation thank you so enlightening and thank you for being part of our program very Truly much appreciated pleasure. all right very much appreciated okay thank you Thank you. I have no idea where to go from here. Okay. Um, am I still on? Yes. Um, okay. A reminder for all attendees that uh, take the survey, um, and it's you'll find it on that site again of, of uh, Zufol Health one word dot org slash cde uh, do it within the week and you will get your certificates for credit our next program is on wednesday september 27th uh, again at 6 uh, p.m it's dr mark gimbel who is uh, an excellent endodontist and his program is utilizing advanced endodontic techniques and technology to enhance root canal success uh, he has worked with us and our residents, and I know him personally as a referring dentist and as a friend. It's uh, He offers a really amazing program. So thank you, and uh, thank you for attending. Good night. Good night. Have a nice evening, Howard. Thank you, and thank you so much.